You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, with service members from across the military, sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Joining us this week on the Hazard Ground Podcast, he is a retired Marine Staff Sergeant. You may also have seen him on TV as his work now is currently helping veterans uh, with all their causes, with all their problems and issues. He is Johnny Joey Jones on the Hazard Ground Podcast. Johnny, welcome. Thank you for being here, man. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on today. Well, we appreciate you being here, and uh, we want to know your story and how you got started in the Marine Corps. When did you sign up? Why did you sign up? Yeah, well, I joined the Marine Corps back in 2005. Uh, at the time, the, the economy was was charged along really well. Uh, both my parents were were manual labor people. My dad was a brick and block mason. My mom cleaned houses. And quite honestly, I was young. I was dumb. I tell people all the time I was just smart enough to know how dumb I was acting. And uh, and I kind of saw that I needed to change the direction. And, uh, and I joked that I had the best recruiter out there, or at least he had the easiest job because – when I showed up, I told him I wanted to go to boot camp, and that's really all I cared about. And uh, and so when I probably personally wanted to be more of a reservist, he signed me up for almost six years. So I think he, he did a good job, six years active duty. And uh, and so my original uh, contract was to go into the Marine Corps. And I had this misunderstanding because no one in my family, uh, since my great-grandfather, had been in the Marine Corps. And those uncles I had uh, in Vietnam – one had went AWOL, the other one had passed away, so they weren't the best guys to ask about. Um, so I'm going into the Marine Corps with not a lot of influence or understanding, and I kind of thought everyone was a rifleman because that's what the Marine Corps said, so everyone was infantry, and then some of us were smart enough to have other jobs. I had no clue how it really worked, so I went in as a, as a communications repairman, and uh, in about a year and 29 palms, I was done with that, looking for something different and, uh, and not to go too far down the road at one time. I ended up uh, finding EOD after my first deployment. Well, and again, as an EOD tech, you're defusing bombs and, uh, you know, doing all that high-level work, and there's not a lot of you guys, but uh, I, we know from experience we've had other EOD guys on here that that job is just – it's dangerous, and it's it's hard to find guys who can do it and do it well, and the ones who uh, do it very long are very rare. So what was it that led you to EOD? I mean, you seem to indicate that – you, you were kind of bored with your job, I guess, in what you had initially signed up for the Marine Corps for. So what led you to EOD? Well, honestly, you know, when I joined, I really went into the office in 2004. We're only a few years into this war. And I remember thinking, man, if we don't if we don't hurry up and get in this, it's going to be over before we have a chance. You know, and little did I know there were at least 10 to 15 more years of this war yeah. going to be in front of me. <laughs> uh, so I, I find I'll look back and think about how funny that is. But that's, you know. It was kind of like one of those where well, you had the invasion and then you had Fallujah and then anything after that, it felt like the sense of urgency to, to be in combat. And uh, and for me, that's what was important. You know, Once you get into the Marine Corps, you have drill instructors that just came back from war and, and there's this urgency to earn your stripes, to go to war, to, to actually you know play the game you trained for. And the job I went into, and, and please understand, this is not to take away from anyone. I think the most heroic thing having been in the worst of combat and the least of combat, the most heroic thing you could do is raise your right hand during a time of war and serve your country. Absolutely. Everything else after that is pretty circumstantial. But for me, for my goals, I wanted more. Um, so out of 29 Palms, I went to uh, Kaneohe Bay, Hawaii, and then Pearl Harbor and was kind of doing this very technical job where I would repair radios. And I had the opportunity to – guard one of the nuclear subs as they pulled the rods out and put them back in at Pearl Harbor. And there we had to do drills with the EOD team. So I, um, I had a chance to meet those guys and eventually went into uh, doing uh, kind of an interview with them because in the Marine Corps, you can't just sign up to be EOD. It's the only service you have to laterally move into EOD. Um, and so you kind of have to earn your stripes, be 21 years old, be the rank of sergeant or promotable to and kind of have these prerequisites the other services don't put on that job field. And so it's a little bit more elite feeling. And so that, that was all the rewards were there. And then I had a chance to go to Iraq in 2007, actually as an, as an OJT on the job training, uh, EOD tech and waiting basically. And that doesn't happen ever. So I took that deployment, got to see those guys work firsthand um, just fell in love with the job field, the camaraderie. And most importantly, there's a, there's an added amount of maturity and an added amount of overall perspective 
that I would say is similar to what maybe uh, a Mustang officer has or, or even a seasoned officer, this idea that you're not just, you're not just in command, but you have responsibility. Um, and EOD kind of has that with it. And then on top of that, there's like 60 different schools. You can go to jump school and dive school and, and you support the um, secret service and you do all these fun things too. So it just seemed like the best path in front of me if I were going to reenlist or stay in the Marine Corps. Um, and I was inspired by the guys I saw in Iraq in 2007. So I finished out that deployment, stayed on with those guys for three and a half more months and then came back, was school trained uh, and went back actually as a team leader in 2010. I want to kind of just backtrack for a moment when you talk about raising your right hand in a time of war to serve your country. When you did that initially to sign up for the Marine Corps, was it because you wanted to fight for your country? Was there a sense of patriotism? I know you said you were kind of doing dumb things. It was just to kind of get your life in order and maybe deploying would be a byproduct of that. You know, I, I sit and wonder every day, like, what really was going through my mind back then? I, <laughs> I really can't speak for 17-year-old Joey Jones, but what I can tell you is, um, there was a young man a few years ahead of me, had been a part of the invasion with the Army, come back to our history class and did a slideshow. And I know that inspired me so much to think, man, this is a part of history. And this was just a year after we saw the towers fall in gym class. And only a few years after my best friend's dad, who had taken Mike Battery, Chattanooga, Tennessee, to Desert Storm, told us about his experiences. And, and kind of a lot of things hit me a few years in a row. To where I'd grown up believing, you know, military was just the farthest away of, of anything. And then, you know, those last few years of high school kind of chipped away at it to where by the time I graduated, there was a certain level of patriotism and, man, I don't want to miss out on this opportunity. And then very much so on my day-to-day -day life, there was realizing I was headed down the wrong road and I needed to straighten myself up. So I think it was a little bit of both, probably leaning more into uh, trying to get that you know, back then they would lay these plates out that said discipline, responsibility, judgment, and all these different character traits. And I think that, you know, I wanted those for myself. I wanted to be a better version of myself. And that's why I went to the Marine Corps. They advertised that first and foremost. And, uh, and that's where I ended up. When you speak to people now, uh, or whether it's, you know, on television or whatever it may be, or even in smaller groups, high school settings, college settings, are you cognizant of everything you say because of the way it was made an impression on you as a young man? Yeah, absolutely. Listen, you know, I, I laid in the hospital bed uh, with half my body bandaged up, what the half that was left. And, uh, and everyone that came in the room had an opportunity to inspire, leave an impression on me. And very few did. Um, and, and the few that did and how they did, I've, I've thought through that. I've reflected on that. And I feel like, you know, it's not my choice to try to go out and inspire people, but for some reason, living through what I have and then accomplishing what I have afterwards does inspire people. And so I'm very conscious of that. And I try to uh, tell my story or present my situation or my perspective in a way that people can, you know, they can consume and reflect on their own lives with it and perhaps learn a thing or two or learn from my mistakes. All right, so let's get back to your second deployment. You're a fully qualified EOD tech. It's 2010. You're heading to Afghanistan. Obviously, you know what your mission is. So whatever, wherever roadside bombs are, uh, wherever these things are placed, you, ha you guys have to you know, go out there and defuse them. But what else were you kind of told about this deployment going in and your expectations? Yeah, you know, it's really funny. Basically what happened, if, if you really study the history of this war, in 2000, late 2008, early 2009, President Obama decided to do another troop surge. I had been a part of the one in Al Anbar, Iraq in 2007 and 8, and it was very successful. Um, so that was the strategy uh, that President Obama chose to implement in Afghanistan, down in Helmand and some of the other provinces in, in the uh, agricultural region where a lot of poppy was being grown and a lot of funding for terrorism was happening. So part of that was to send 30,000 more troops, the majority of which were Marine Corps infantry units uh, to the to the heavily uh, to the heavy Taliban area of Helmand, the Garmsar River Valley of Nauzad and uh, Marja and Sangin and these very famous battles now were all in that area. And the idea was to saturate that area with the Marines, get a uh, get a basically a presence in places where uh, if we were there one day, the Taliban would be there six days a week. So we decided to just be there seven days a week and push them out. 
And that was kind of the premise of the deployment was to be a part of the surge and push the Taliban out of its last major stronghold. At that point, we were, we were really winning. And, um, and so we didn't get there to 2010. Um, for example, to kind of make you understand the difference between the Iraq and Afghanistan war, um, a lot of people like to lump those together. It's completely different enemies, fought in completely different places. But yes, very much we could so. deploy, you know, 12 EOD techs to support a regiment, which is about the largest unit of soldiers, sailors, airmen, or Marines will deploy at one time, a regiment. And so we could deploy 12 EOD techs to support them. They could work in trucks, use robots, electronic countermeasures, basically what you saw in Hurt Locker. You move over to Afghanistan in 2010. The area was so rural, um, the lack of infrastructure was such a problem for us, we couldn't drive trucks anywhere. Everything was on foot. And so instead of a dozen for a regiment, we had 64 EOD techs for a regiment. We had two EOD techs per company and in some places four EOD techs per company. And what that meant was going into that deployment the year before I got there, the casualties and um, injuries were starting to go up. And we really had a sense of, okay, this isn't what we saw in Iraq. There isn't a robot. Uh, we had already abandoned using bomb suits because they weren't very effective. But, you know, we don't have a robot. We don't have our countermeasures. We don't have all these tools. It's really going to be, you know, our hands uh, working on these devices, rendering them safe. And so there was a heightened sense of awareness, but it hadn't really hit us yet. We'd had one or two more guys get injured, one one or two more guys get killed. Um, and going into that deployment with 64 EOD, Marine Corps EOD techs, we came out on the other side. We lost 11 guys killed in action. We had uh, almost 20 guys receive amputation over that year. And so, you know, we came out on the other end at a 33% uh, casualty rate. And, uh, and that is just insane for any one unit, much less a job field. You know, we were under 400 at the time, and we were getting percentages of our job field killed in action. And, um, and that's unprecedented. It doesn't get the same kind of attention because we're deployed out in small teams rather than being one unit in one area. Uh, but it was really tough. And, and I was on the early side of that going into it. I, you know, what really happened for me was one night early in the deployment, um, two incidents, one of our guys lost his legs and another one lost his life. And I woke up that next morning and I remember just running every lap I could around the helo pad for like two hours till my feet were bleeding. And I didn't realize at the time, but afterwards I realized I was doing that because I was afraid I might not get to run again, <laughs> you know, and it was becoming a reality uh, that, that IEDs were the weapon of choice. They were much simpler and much more effective, a whole lot harder to find. And, and it was going to be a tough road for us to get home. Well, let so. me ask you, Joey, because, you know, being the get, that you guys are EOD techs, and the, for the civilians listening out there, I mean, think of an EOD tech in the military uh, akin to maybe a heart surgeon in, you know, the civilian world. There's really a finite number of people who do the job and do it well. And so they are in such high demand, as you, as you just explained. And there's, there's Marine EOD, there's Army EOD, and there's even Air Force EOD. So there's, but there's not a lot of them. The, the numbers are very finite. When you see your guys starting to get injured and starting to get killed doing this job, how hard is it to get up every day knowing that it's only a matter of time before your number is called, so to speak? Well, you know, really what it is, uh, if you ever have a chance to read any book ever, read On Killing by Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. And he talks about the necessity of conditioning. And thankfully for me, I came into a unit that just came back from a really tough place called Nalzad in late 2008. We trained to 2009. When we deployed in 2010, most of the guys I deployed with had seen these IEDs, had, had seen these scenarios, some of them in the same place. And we, very, we felt very much trained, conditioned, and ready for the task at hand. And when you, when you hear, well, to take a step back, something we do that's incredibly unique to our job field is that we carry around what we call briefcase internet, VSAT, um, and we have the opportunity to access one another all over the country in, in that day. And so what we do is anytime we go out and work an IED, a possible IED, anytime we go out and do any kind of call, we come back and make a detailed briefing on that, complete with pictures and descriptions, and we send that into a database. And every night, as an EOD team leader, you go and read those reports from all your neighboring EOD teams and see the lessons they learned that day. To include if someone gets hurt or killed, their teammate or another team next to them comes, does a post-blast analysis, and they look for what went wrong. 
And, uh, and so what you program in your mind is I'm going to do everything right and I'm going to win. Um, at the end of the day, what you know is you can do everything right. And if the enemy doesn't make a mistake, sometimes they just, win. that's just how IEDs are. But all you can control is what you can do. You can't control what the enemy did. You can't control the type of IED it is. You can't control how it got there and how long it's been there and if the power source is hooked up and if it's metallic or not. You can't control those things. All you can control is how you respond to it and how you prosecute that IED. Um, So you have to have confidence that you'll make the right choices all along the way. And at the end of the day, every IED you come across will be rendered safe properly and, and you'll go on to the next one. Um, when you have a, a friend or a brother or sister, because there are females, um, when you have one that, that um, you know gets hit, you look for, well, what mistake did they make or what did they not see? But then you remind yourself to look for that and not make that mistake and keep pushing forward. And just for more background for people, you know, the enemy, and this was true of Iraq and in Afghanistan when it comes to IEDs and roadside bombs, they were constantly changing the way they would do these things because it was it was a chess match. So like they would choose path A to make a bomb and we would figure out how to defuse it. Then they would choose path B, we would figure that out and so on and so forth. And we would just go back and forth, you know, trying to figure out ways to uh, to to thwart the enemy's uh, attempts at trying to kill us. And, and you run around and you go in circles. Did you ever come across a bomb in your time that you didn't feel like you could defuse or you had to call for help on? I mean, did any of those scenarios stick out? Well, quite honestly, man, that's not an option. <laughs> you know, <laughs> when when you're over top of an IED, there is no, there is no, um, what was that game? W- Want to be a millionaire or whatever? There is yeah. no lifeline uh, call. Yeah, yeah there's call no a lifeline. Friend. <laughs> it, you know, so the lifeline is to read those reports every night because even though we draw battle lines and I say, okay, this is my area, that's my teammate's area, the enemy doesn't do that. Chances are it's the same bomb makers that the team, you know, uh, 10 miles away is working with. Um, where I'm at. And so you read those reports, you get familiar. What you're talking about is very astute and it's absolutely true. There is a chess game to it. For example, our number one defense when we don't have the robots against the IEDs are metal detectors. Um, Going into that deployment, most of the main charges, the part that goes boom, was made in a metal cylinder with all the um, explosives packed inside of it to create frag. And what the enemy realized is that if they used a plastic jug instead of a metal cylinder, it'd be harder for us to find it. They would lose their frag, but they would gain efficiency. And that happened while I was there, and we had to learn to adjust to that. So much so that by the time I was injured, if you were only sweeping with your metal detector where you walked, none of those components would have metal in them. The switch and the main charge would be in the attack area, and then the only thing that would be metallic would be the power source, and it would be ran forever away and you would have to understand your environment to even know to find the power source first and so um it became more difficult as they played the chess game and they don't just change it to uh circumvent what we do to defeat them they also change it to where the things we do to defeat the IEDs actually play in their favor for example if we use electronic jamming to stop a signal from coming in then they'll just wire the IEDs to where as long as the signal comes in, they don't blow up. And as soon as the signal doesn't come in, they do blow up. And so so on and forth, uh, so on and so forth. Oh, our number one line of defense on that chess game, actually, is to make friends with the local people, gather human intelligence, understand the types of IEDs, and more importantly, have people tell you where those IEDs are. And that took account for probably 50% of the IEDs that we encountered was actually someone giving us a lead as to where they may be. Um, and you do that by gaining people's trust and being a contributive member of their community while you're there. You know, hearing you drop some of the technical language of the bombs, uh, I begin to wonder, and again, even though I'm a military guy, uh, I'm not EOD qualified. Uh, what If people ask you kind of what your job would be akin to, I know I mentioned a heart surgeon before, but the difficulty of your job, can, is there a civilian kind of counterpart as far as the difficulty level that you could equate it to? Well, it, it's hard to it's hard to think about. I think of like the MythBusters guys. Yeah, I mean, we're more scientists than we are anything. And the reason why, I, and I I don't let me take a step back. Very few of us have a PhD, although some of us do. Very few of us have an engineering degree, although some of us do. Most all of us are trained in that University of Bombs and Bullets down in Destin, Florida. But with that being said, by the time you finish EOD school, which is twelve hours a day, every day they can get you in there for about a year. 
um, you've learned nuclear physics, you've learned um, chemistry, you've learned, you know, uh, engineering up one side and down the other, electronic engineering. And you've learned enough of each of these things to be dangerous. And so that's actually what is attractive about the job. It's not the IEDs. That's kind of a that's a burden within the job. But to go out and do some of the other things we do, say if a local SWAT team is going to take down a meth lab, if there's a military base close by, they're going to call in an EOD tech to come help out. We actually learned to disassemble meth labs in EOD school because that is something that is highly volatile. Clandestine labs in general could blow because they're makeshift and they don't have any safety precautions. So to be that kind of asset to your community and just to learn and, and to get those experiences, it's, it's, it's a really nerdy thing that puts you in the heat of combat. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's uh, just the way you describe it. I, I certainly can hear the the passion in your voice for it, and thank God there are guys like you out there. So you've watched some of your friends get hurt, you've watched some of your teammates get killed, uh, and then you come up on August 6, 2010. Take me through that morning, that day when you got up. What was going through your mind? Was it a normal day? How did it go? Yeah, so to kind of set the stage, we had my teammate and I had worked in um, – the Helmand River Valley supporting kind of the same unit most of our deployment. We had moved around a little bit. And what happens is you you usually would traditionally work in a three-man team, a team leader, another guy called an A-slash or an assistant team leader who could fill that role. And then your youngest, newest guy would be your team mate. And, and those three would work together. And then, you know, each deployment, you cycle up a step. And that's kind of how the job field works. But when we got to Afghanistan and realized, hey, we can't get – from point A to point B, besides on foot, we had to have more teams in more areas. And the only way to do that was to cut the numbers. So we, when we chopped down to two-man teams, what that meant was if someone got injured or killed on a team, we don't allow EOD techs to work by themselves most of the time. That, that unit loses its EOD support until we can get another tech there to work with who's left. And so we, we were really just sparse. I mean, we had units that didn't have EOD support by the end of that tour when we started with each unit having one to two teams and so what that means is that many guys got killed and injured so um what happened was there was a a town called safar bazaar we had left it alone most of the war really um it didn't pose a threat most of the time and because of that the enemy had found it it was out away from the water source it was in the middle of the desert it was a trading post and they had basically turned it into a place where they could stockpile IED components and hide guys we were looking for and push them back to the river valley and continue the war against us. So we finally got clearance, which at the time was really difficult to do, to go in, raid the town, destroy the IED components and wrap up any bad guys. So we took about 200 Marines. Uh, We took an Army route clearance unit and a a Marine Corps obstacle uh, clearance unit, which on the Marine Corps side meant bulldozers and on the Army side meant ground penetrating radars and, and kind of backhoe digging hands. And, um, and we started to clear this town. So we had three EOD teams. So that was six techs, one team, two of the techs was in a, in a static position. That's kind of the cavalry on, on top of the hill. Another team was tasked with clearing our medevac route out of the town. Well, my teammate and I were tasked with the majority of the work, which was to clear street by street and block by block. And, and push the bad guys out of the town. So we fought for a few days, and by and then once the bad guys realized that we brought a lot of gunpowder, they kind of just left. But what they left behind was a minefield. And so over five days, my teammate and I cleared um, 38 IEDs. Um, on the sixth morning, uh, there was a, a, a structure we had identified as a hotel uh, through Falcon View or, or the drones and come to realize it was a storage facility. And as the engineers um, began kind of clearing that building, they found components to IEDs that they hadn't seen before, called in us. We identified them as new to the area of operation. We called in certified law enforcement officers, which are basically there to help take forensics. Um, And I kind of leaned up against the wall. And honestly, what happened was uh, the bad guys had started gathering, scavenging our own unexploded ordnance from the battlefield. And they brought in this really big, Basically, it's a giant candle. So you drop it from a plane, a parachute pops open, it ignites it, and it lights up the sky and provides light at night. And my teammate had moved it, and I remembered it from EOD school. You're not supposed to move them because you could set them off. And so I went to check on it. He had put it behind a little wall, and I shined my flashlight into it to see if it were armed and realized it wasn't and kind of hung out for a minute. 
And uh, once I saw those uh, forensics guys come towards me from about 200 yards away, I put my gear back on, took a step forward, and when I did, I stepped on an IED. Um, that area had been cleared three times. I didn't have a reason to suspect there'd be an IED there. And that time, the, the enemy had done everything right, and there was not much I could do. So um, the IED went off. I knew that's what it was as soon as it happened. Contrary to popular belief, it rarely actually knocks you out. Um, you have to get pretty much hit in the head and suffer concussion, and usually the blast alone isn't enough to do that. So I landed on my back. I knew exactly – as soon as I landed on my back, I knew what happened. I looked down. My legs weren't there anymore. Um, in front of me, about 10 yards in front of me, was a Marine engineer named Daniel Greer. Um, he was laying there barely breathing. I reached up with my right hand to try to grab a tourniquet because I knew I needed to get some tourniquets on because there weren't any Marines close by to help me out. And uh, and when I reached up to grab the tourniquet, not to be too, I guess, um, too gruesome, but – uh, my right hand had, had pretty much been blown away from my forearm. So when I reached up, my, my arm came up, my hand didn't. And uh, and that's when I kind of realized it was a bad scenario. So I uh, just began yelling for help because I knew Daniel might need help. And I, and I wasn't sure there was going to be a whole lot of hope for me at that time. Well, so, okay. Oh, dear Lord, God. You're the first person I've talked to. And we've talked to several people who have been blown up and, and lost limbs that knew exactly what happened when it happened. I, I, I mean, that's, I guess because you're so used to being in that environment and, you know, the bombs and everything, I'm, I'm assuming, but it goes off and you had to be pushed back. You had to be thrown somewhere just because of the, the percussion of the explosion, correct? Yeah, I was thrown about 20 yards okay. in the air. Um, and, and not to gloss over certain parts, but basically when I stepped on the IED, everything went, went tan, really, is what happened. You, you, it's not that you hear a ring, you just can't hear and you can't see because there's sand everywhere. Um, and when I landed on my back, uh, about 20 yards away, um, I knew exactly what happened. I mean, I'd put tourniquets on probably six dudes at that point. I'd seen it happen. I mean, just the day before, uh, going into the town or two days before going into the town, uh, a Marine had, had, uh, had actually activated an ID, but not been on top of it. So, I was astutely aware of what that looks and feels like uh, over the course of my deployment. So it, it wasn't about sitting there wondering what in the hell happened. It was about, okay, what do I do now? And, you know, only only combat can get you to that point yeah. where you're trained that well, and that's what had happened. So the, the first reaction was to put tourniquets on myself in case um, nobody can get to me. Um, I didn't, didn't have a, a limb left to – to fight with so uh you'll hear stories about guys you know grabbing the rifle well you know the the, the enemy was the id and i didn't have anything left to use the rifle with so at that point it was all about uh getting tourniquets on me so i didn't bleed out on the battlefield um and become a hindrance to everybody you know in that way so if i could keep myself from bleeding out then i could stay aware answer questions and help help the guys out uh because there was a chance Marines that weren't EOD techs or trained in EOD procedures were going to have to come get me. And the minute I stepped on that IED, that became a live minefield because uh, we never assumed there's just one. Um, and that's what I did. I, I uh, As the Marines got to me, I, I told them kind of where I had stepped, what, what the path to take, um, told them my kill number, told them I was going into shock, uh, tried to listen to see what was going on with Greer. And we ended up losing Greer. He had uh, oddly enough, he got hit in the head and the traumatic brain injury was enough to take his life a few days later. And uh, that's kind of the irony of war, you know. So you, you look down and your legs are gone and you didn't flinch like nothing came over you at all? No, you know, it was all about survival at that point. You know, by the time I could see my legs were gone, I knew they were gone. I just stepped on an IED. You rarely live through that. And when you do, you don't keep all your parts. Uh, yeah. And I, and I knew the size and scope of it just by feel. Um, so there wasn't a, a huge moment of, of, oh my God, because you're trained and conditioned at that point to expect the worst and react to the worst. Anything less than the worst is a good day. Um, and that's how it works, you know? So when I looked down and my legs were gone, the only question I asked was, do I still have a knee? Because that would have been huge for my recovery. Unfortunately, I didn't. Um, I asked the guy to say the Lord's prayer with me when he finally did start putting tourniquets on because... I knew I, I could feel myself going into shock. I thought I felt myself fading, but what was actually happening was my eyes were swelling shut. 
And so I'm like, you know, I'm not super religious, but let's cover some bases here, get this one out of the way in case we don't wake up tomorrow. And uh, I don't mean to chuckle, our, but the way you said it was very matter of fact. I'm not religious, but I let's just throw this one in there. The, the guy putting the tourniquets on was laughing with me. We couldn't, <laughs> neither one of us could remember the Lord's Prayer, so we kind of just made it up and, and had a laugh over it. <laughs> Uh, that's beautiful. I, I, I certainly, again, I don't mean to laugh at you, but the way you tell it was no, very, it you know, funny. uh, but okay. So how do you ultimately get off the battlefield? What happens? Do you know, are you awake? Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was conscious longer than my eyes were awake. So essentially what happened, they put tourniquets on, they got gear off first cause his head was bleeding. Um, and I remember one of the guys that got to him yelled, we've got a heavy breather. And I remember thinking, and, and I'm not going to use the words on here, but I remember thinking, what in the blank is a heavy breather? Like, that is not a term I have heard. I remember analyzing in that moment on the battlefield, what does that mean? Because I was incredibly concerned about Daniel because he was standing too close to me to begin with. And it's my job to keep the people around me safe. Um, and, and, I, and I realized that after the fact that I should have pushed him back. Um, now, I wasn't performing DOD procedures, so technically, no, he wasn't too close to me, but I was still there working as an EOD tech, and our our instinct is to push everyone away from us as we do our job, because if we get hit, it just needs to be us, nobody else. And I remember worrying a whole lot about Daniel. Um, I remember them putting me on a stretcher, and what they did is they had something there called a mobile trauma bay, and so we brought trucks with us as far as we could. They were about two kilometers outside of the town we were held up in. And so they ran, got one of these trucks, and it was a sterile box on the back of a seven-ton truck, and they put me in it. And in there, they started working on me. And I remember thinking, man, I've lost my legs. I can't afford to lose my arm, and I knew my right arm was hit really bad. So I remember thinking, man, if I can just hide this arm and they don't see it till they get me to Bagram or Leatherneck or Launch Tool, they can save it there because, you know, we go through live tissue training, and – MRSA and the infection was so bad at that time, we were taught to cut off about a half an inch of live tissue and try to get the infection out. And I'm thinking, well, man, I don't know if I have that much in my arm, but they can get me to a better hospital. They can do it better and keep my arm. Um, and so I remember worrying about that. It's kind of like, you know, I don't want to do squats again, but at least let me do curls. You know, and I was single <laughs> at the time. And, um, and we actually had a female nurse there. I remember her holding my hand and, uh, and I remember telling her, you know, keep my arm, keep my arm. And later I was told um, by the, uh, the commanding officer who came to see me that I uh, was repeating over and over again, uh, I'm sorry, I screwed up. And, uh, and I didn't know that until after the fact. There's a, there's a TED Talk that kind of brings me to tears every time that we had embed reporters with us, and he gives the TED Talk and tells that story. And, um, and I didn't know it at the time. I don't remember it, but apparently that's what I was saying. But I remember thinking, man, I hope they don't take my arm. Um, and uh, – and so, I, you know, I remember getting moved around, and I remember them put me on the bird, and then they, when they got me on the bird, they knocked me out. And, uh, and I woke up four days later, two days later. I woke up two days later um, in launch stool, and what it was, I lost so much blood, it took them two days to, to get me out of country. They couldn't move me. Um, and, uh, and so when I woke up in launch stool, they woke me up. I remember very uh, vividly that, the nurse came in after they woke me up and said that um, that I lost my legs. I said, yeah, I know. And I said, did I, do I have a knee? And she said, no, you don't. And I said, well, man. She goes, don't worry. You're you're really healthy and you'll walk again. And I never doubted her. Uh, she told me right there on August 8th, 2010, wow. I would walk again. And and by the time I got to D.C. August 10th, I was ready to get at it. You know, I never I never doubted her, and I don't know why. Um, I in it. I, I am in <laughs> awe. I'm sorry to cut you. I am in awe of the mental clarity you had through this whole thing. I don't think we've spoken to anybody who has expressed such mental clarity going through this either. You know, because I think your mind tends to wander. I, I'm surprised you haven't told me yet that you were concerned about your nether regions as a male, because usually that's <laughs> the first question everybody asked. Is that intact? Did you wonder about that? I actually did ask that, oh, but okay. I, I don't always bring it up in the story. Uh, I asked about the knee and then asked about that. Um, and that was the, that was the actual reason that the guy and I chuckled, but that's not always the best, uh, the best thing. And, and I'll tell you, I don't know your audience fully, but when I give speeches in person, if it's a good audience for it, I'll say, I'll, I'll tell them kind of one of my punchlines will, I'll say, I'll tell, explain how I got hurt. And, what, and when I get to that moment, I'll say, I looked down and I was worried about having one thing and one thing only. 
because it was so important to me as a as a red blooded American male. This one thing was so important, and and I'll kind of pause, and you'll see the audience like starting to chuckle, and I'll go a knee. I wanted a knee, and, <laughs> and everybody laughing I'm like get your minds out of the gutter. Um, and so yeah, I did ask about okay. that. Okay, but it just the, the the way you can recall everything with such accuracy. I mean most people are hazy about it. I'm just, I'm, I, you know, I, there's not a question here. I'm just telling you I'm in awe of the detail with which you can describe this all. So after the nurse told you you were going to walk, did, when did you start asking about your arm? Did you look at your arm? Did you see what kind of condition it was in? Yeah, when they woke me up in Germany, I had a, an external fixture. So I had rods coming out of my arm in a bunch of different places. Uh, one of my fingers was amputated. And actually, my other hand, uh, my other wrist was all all fixed up too. And, and I actually couldn't was more worried about it because I didn't think it got hurt at all. And so it ended up having and had a double perilunar dislocation, which meant that more than three bones on both sides of my wrist were completely dislocated from the ligaments that hold them together. And that's about like one in one in about 50 million odds to get it on both wrists at the same time. Um, and so that really sucked because without one arm I could use, that was going to prolong or they thought it was going to prolong my prosthetic rehabilitation for my legs um and and basically what happened was the ied went off on my right side so my right leg was a lot worse off my right arm was worse off my right side of my face was had shrapnel in it or frag in it actually and so everything was on the right side i thought the left side would be good and here my left arm is all wrapped up too the reason i can recall everything with clarity was it didn't knock me out it may it may not have even given me a full-on concussion and i didn't get pain meds for a long time and so there was nothing to stop me from experiencing it vividly, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, which kind of sucked in the moment, but it's good for now. It means I felt all the pain, but it also means I have that memory that I wouldn't trade for the world because that's the moment that I, that I chose to live. You know, and that's the moment that I chose not to give up. And I need to know what that feels like because there'll be a day when things get truly bad, not five o'clock traffic bad, but, you know, I'll, I'll lose a loved one or, or be on my own deathbed. And I'll remember what that means that you have that choice, that it may not decide whether or not your body keeps living, but it decides that between now and when that happens, you keep living. And, uh, and that's important to me. So I wouldn't trade that memory for anything in the world. So at no point were you ever scared of dying? I didn't know if I was going to die. And I was in such, I call it get shit done mode. I was in what do I do next mode that I don't remember fearing it because it was, if I died, did I do this? So it was important to me if I were going to die on the battlefield that I said the Lord's Prayer, I didn't become a burden to these guys, and that I told this dude that I don't remember who he was or or, or I didn't recognize him in the moment, um, that I had a seven-year-old little boy, or uh, well, now he's seven, but at the time I had a one-year-old little boy back home named Braden and make sure his daddy was thinking about him. And that was it. That's all I said, and that's all I was worried about. Yeah, there have been times since then that I've looked back thinking, man, I can't believe I almost died. Or there, there are specific IEDs I look back and go, wow, that was really stupid. I could have died in that moment. And it scares the life out of me. But in the moment, that fear wasn't there. Um, and I can only contribute to the Marine Corps and my brothers for, for training me that way. The road to recovery in your situation is long, it's arduous, it, 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 underscoring every word in the English language would not sell it the, the way it's properly supposed to be. Only you guys can can really tell us that. But at what point during your recovery did you hit a wall? Um, did you feel like it wasn't going to get better? Did you get depression? Any of those things? Um, you know, I like to say no. The, the true answer is probably a little bit, but there's a few things that stuck out. I had a very unique experience. Uh, so to kind of catalog the whole story, I graduated in high school in 2004, went off to the Marine Corps, lost my high school sweetheart of about three years as she stayed in the hometown and, and finished her last year of high school. And that broke my heart. And I'm such a, I'm such a one-track mind guy. It's very good for my goals, but it also makes me hard to live with. I never believed that I wouldn't get her back. It was just, what do I need to do to get her back? It was my right. mentality. So as she went on to college and got engaged to a guy, I never, I was too stubborn to accept any of that. And, you know, some people could call it stalking. I called it staying in touch, even though she had my number <laughs> blocked. But I, I kind of knew what was going on with her. And, and in, a, in a turn of events that you couldn't lay out in, in, in days of our lives, 
I ended up getting a call in 2009, Halloween, October 2009. I got a call that that this one night stand October 2008 had resulted in a three month old son that I didn't know about. And it was with a young lady in my hometown that I never dated. Um, she was on vacation in Destin, Florida. I'm from a small town in Georgia. I was down there going to EOD school. We ran into each other and that's what happened. She was so ashamed. She never told me about him. And then finally, when he was three months old, she decided to tell me, um, probably no coincidence the same weekend that it happened the year before. But uh, I got that call, and that changed my whole life. And then it, from them, that point on, everything wasn't about what makes me happy. If I live or die, it's about what I do for him between now and that point. And that's how I live my life. Well, when I deployed if about six months later, uh, or well, yeah, about six months later, uh, four months later, um, I had regained contact with my high school sweetheart who lived in the same hometown and had actually been around my little boy because it's a really small town. And that's how we reconnected. She was just talking to me about that. So I deployed, man. I was a playboy. I had an immaculate body, uh, was in the coolest job in the Marine Corps, in my opinion, living in Southern California, dirt bikes and crotch rockets and all the fun in the world. I deployed that guy. I came back, no legs. My body was about to go through the worst atrophy ever. I had uh, reconnected with my high school sweetheart. When I was in law school, Germany, her house number was the only one I could remember. So I called her from the hospital and made her promise how on pain meds she would come visit me. So I, I got to, to D.C. at Walter Reed. She was there. My little boy was there. It was a whole new life, man. We uh, She packed her bags for three days. Three years later, we got married. So I really lost my legs. I got a wife and a son out of it. And that support network and, more importantly, that responsibility – never allowed me to get too far down. It never allowed me to accept failure. It never allowed me to believe I wouldn't walk again. I wouldn't work again. I wouldn't be a dad just like any other dad out there. When my little boy goes to play baseball or dance, or whatever it is he wants to do, that, you know, I can't allow my own pain and discomfort and my own negativity to get in the way of what she deserves in a husband and he deserves in a dad. And that's how I live my life. And from the time I got back forward, once I knew that that was going to be my life and, um, and what happened, the way I dealt with it, two things, really. One, I was one of the first guys to get hurt that bad, but there was a, a tidal wave of them every, it seemed like every day, but it was every week after that. A lot of them in my job field, in my small fraternity, they needed someone to show them that it was going to be okay. And I got to do that for them and it healed me in the process. And then the other side of that was I told myself, you know, you got to be strong for them, but you also got to give yourself an opportunity to not be strong. So every time they'd bring in lunch, I kick everybody out of the room. And as I ate my lunch, I would pitch a fit and scream and cuss God and the devil and the government and the Taliban and everybody in between. <laughs> and to begin with, that was a half an hour. And within a month, it was only five minutes. And by the second month, I didn't need to do it anymore. I was cool with it. It's beautiful, man. I mean, I, I'd love to give you a hug. Like, I just, uh, I love hearing it. I just, I mean, <laughs> I the way it works out, it, I, you know, like you said, you're not religious, but God obviously has a plan. And I, I'm not going to get into a religious spiel, but there's too much uh, of good things happening there for not, not to be some sort of higher power looking over you and, uh, and Absolutely. continuing to bless you. So uh, where are you right now as far as recovery is concerned? I mean, it's 2017. It's almost 10 years later, or seven years later, rather, uh, from, your, from your injury date. How are you physically? Well, uh, I'm great. And, and I'll tell you, kind of, this is my timeline. And a lot of people don't believe it. It's absolutely true. And I, and I don't know what to tell you is the reason. But I was injured August 6, 2010. I started walking and gained my independence February 2011, and I started working on Capitol Hill as a as a fellow at the House Veterans Affairs Committee. Uh, Ten months after I got injured on in June 2011, um, I I sped through my recovery. Um, I learned how to walk with, before my arms were working again, and um, my wounds healed quick because I was in really really good shape, and my body had the energy there to heal. Um, I also did everything they told me to, and then some. I was in therapy twice a day. Um, I, I had them convinced <laughs> I was actually lying to them. So I ended up with two therapists and they didn't know it. I'd have one in the morning and one in the afternoon and they didn't know about each other. And it let me do my therapy, you know, in twice the time. I just, you know, I just got a little bit more pain, a lot more exhaustion, but my goal was to get done with that as soon as possible to not be a victim anymore. than I had to, to not be a patient anymore. than I had to, I despise that word. 
Um, I wanted to stand and look people in the eye, not in the belly button. I couldn't stand the wheelchair. Um, I wanted to walk. I wanted to get back to my life, whatever that may be. Um, and, and so part of that for me was getting through it quicker. Now I can tell you there were, there were repercussions from that that came back at me years later that I've had to work through, but I wouldn't change it for anything because nothing could have healed me mentally and psychologically as much as getting out of that hospital as quick as possible, going back into the real world where people expected me to be somewhere at nine, be there till five, do stuff in between. Um, and so that has guided my views in politics. Uh, I've been more active, um, and to kind of take a step back and I'm sorry to throw it all at you, but basically what happened when I realized I was recovering quickly, the VA and DOD couldn't move the paperwork as quickly as I was recovering. So there was going to be six to 12 months where they were processing me through their system that I was ready to go. So I went and found an opportunity at the House Veterans Affairs Committee, went and bought a suit, cornered the chairman of the House Veterans Affairs Committee at the Commandant of the Marine Corps House at one of their parades one night, told him, hey, look, you're the chairman of the House Veterans Affairs Committee. You're also the representative from the First District of Florida where all the EOD community is. They said you should give me a job. That was on a Friday night. Monday morning, I get a call. Hey, we want you to come up and interview for this fellowship we want to do well they don't know that i'm active duty they don't know the rules and regulations of active duty i go buy a suit i go do the interview write a horrible resume they bring me on board as a as a fellow without any college education or anything like that um they think i'm going to be kind of a, a, a shiny object for them to brag about well i show up at work i go to therapy seven to nine i'm at work by 11 every day i'm there to about 3 34 and i'll even go home so the Marine Corps doesn't know I'm doing this. The hospital doesn't know I'm doing it. And the House Veterans Affairs Committee doesn't know that I'm actually a, a patient at Walter Reed recovering that should be there all day. So I do that for about two months. And um, uh, I passed by a colonel one day in Marine Corps uniform. And I learned that the Marine Corps and all services have what's called an Office of Legislative Affairs, which means they have officers stationed in individual members' offices on Capitol Hill. It's an old tradition, mostly junior officers. And then they have a senior officer who's in charge of them. So he sees me, wants to know more about me, starts researching, finds out I've been up there for two months, blows his lid because there's all these ethics rules, training you have to do, and all this approval you have to get, calls me down to his office really to cuss me out and send me back to Walter Reed. And before he lays into me, he gets a call from the Commandant of the Marine Corps, who had just gotten a call from Chairman Jeff Miller talking about how much they love having me up there, and he's basically stuck with me. Um, and that was my, that was me weaseling my way into politics back in 2011. <laughs> That's fantastic. And, um, and to fast forward some of that, I stayed involved in politics. Uh, I campaigned with Marco Rubio during the presidential primary. I campaigned with Dale Issa and Brian Mast during the, the general election um, and, and, and stood up for the people I believed in. Uh, and I'm a Fox News analyst now, so I go on Fox News and I give uh, an analysis on foreign policy, military issues, mostly VA stuff. Since from 2011 till now, doing these things, I went to school at Georgetown, graduated there in 2014. I did some acting. I was in a movie called Lincoln. Um, I worked in NASCAR for two years with a nonprofit out of D.C., taking Wonder Warriors and NASCAR races. Um, and did all these different things trying to find what it was I wanted to do in life while I recovered and finished school. And um, and so finally in 2014, I moved to Texas to run a nonprofit called Boot Campaign. They focused on working with celebrities that showed the support for the military. I had to amass a pretty cool catalog of celebrities. I ended up meeting one named Zach Brown here in Georgia. And, um, and long story short, uh, he has a 400-acre camp that we're going to move to to focus on kids with autism during camp time and military service members and their families during off season. He hired me to come out here to Georgia and help run that. And, uh, and we also have a bunch of businesses here that I help uh, create opportunities for. Zach is really smart. He owns his own record label. We support the band. We do almost everything in house and I help with a lot of that. So that's what I'm up to now. <laughs> it's an amazing story. Uh, let me ask you, do you miss the Marine Corps? Every day. Every day. I've got the combat gear that I had on the day I got hurt um, mounted in my office. I've got about 300 challenge coins in my box here. I, I, I keep the Marine Corps near and dear to everything I do. 
I, I volunteer with a lot of organizations. Um, I try to stay connected to the veteran community. One thing I learned was that I'm incredibly outgoing, slightly egotistic, um, and I have to work really hard at staying humble, which is the only true character anybody should have. And in doing so, I've learned that there are a lot of these opportunities that come my way because I'm so outgoing that uh, that I can't take advantage of. And so the best thing I can do is take those opportunities and connect them to the veterans that can. And I've learned that's the most fun, the most enjoyment, the, the best thing about my life right now when I'm not being a dad and a husband is to bring these opportunities, these very unique opportunities back to the veteran community. Um, I do a lot with the EOD community, but just the veteran community at large. And um, and I'm, there's, I'm always getting a call, you know, somebody's best friend, you know, this happened to them, that happened to them. They tried to kill themselves or just getting out. They're looking for a job. They live in Pennsylvania and, and, uh, you know, I happen to know a guy that owns a business there and just all these crazy things. And, and really what I've done is just tried to put my network to good use. And it's a lot of fun. I truly, truly enjoy it. Well, the story is inspirational. There's no doubt about it. I, I am just i in awe of everything that you've done since the moment your injury happened and, and the way you've been able to handle and conduct yourself. And, you know, you've got your own website out there. You have your own podcast as well. Uh, you want to tell us about that? Yeah, it's it's been on hiatus for about four months because I, I started the podcast about the time I started this job with Zach and, um, and only one of the two paid the bills. So I really want to focus on this job and get – where I need to be with it. So we're about to start it back here in the next couple of months, probably at the end of summer. It's called Blown Away with JJJ, uh, all pun intended. Um, the first three episodes are with uh, Jacob Schick, the executive director of 22 Kill, uh, Randy Couture, um, multiple-time UFC champion, yep. and then Tommy Laren, uh, formerly of Blaze wow. and probably about to be of some major network because he's got a lot of talent. Um, and the point of the podcast is to get – usually a celebrity figure but someone with a with a compelling story or a good voice that i'm personally friends with get them on there have a conversation similar to this and uh and and really find out what their get up get over it and get going story is and that's a tagline i use which is i believe every day everyone has something that motivates them to get up out of the bed something that they have to get over and then something that they just enjoy that gets them going and uh and, and that's kind of what I focus the podcast around is to get that out of them. And hopefully the people listening can learn from it. Well, look, brother, man, I mean, I hope you keep kicking ass and doing what you're doing. Uh, I know you will, but I continue to wish you nothing but, you know, the greatest of successes. Uh, I'm honored that you've come on this podcast with us. I know this audience is going to be inspired by what you've told them. They'll go check out your podcast. They'll check out your website and everything you're doing. And we'll see you on Fox News and whatever other channel that you may be on. But uh, it's just it's it's been incredible to talk to you. I, I love your story. I want to share it with more people. And I hope everybody listening to this podcast enjoyed it, man. Well, I really appreciate it. It, it was really easy to talk to you. I can tell you've been doing this for a while and you're really good at it. And uh, thank you for your service, obviously. And uh, thanks for letting me come on. I, I enjoy talking and telling the story because it's not my story. It's a collection of all the efforts of all the people around me. And the fact they cared enough about me to put me back together and put me back out there and to pick me up every time I fell down, uh, literally and figuratively, um, that says a lot. That says a whole lot about those people. And and to tell this story and to give them credit is really what it's all about. Well, you have repaid them tenfold. Johnny Joey Jones, again, check out his website. Thank you so much for being part of the Hazard Ground, brother. Yes, sir. Thank you. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno and produced by Matt Pascarella. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com. And if you like the show... Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.